Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. I'd like to welcome everybody to the August 21st meeting of the Alamance County Commissioners. And before we, we begin, uh, if Mr. Lasher will do our invocation. Be glad to. Gracious, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to honor you by thanking you for this day. We thank you for the blessings you share with us each and every day. We ask you to bless our nation, bless this meeting tonight. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, before we begin our meeting, we have a few folks who have signed up to speak and uh, just a reminder, we have a three-minute limit on speaking, and everybody be respectful of the others as they speak, and uh, we'll start with Gary Williams. How you doing? Hey. Good to see y'all, commissioners. Uh, my name's Gary Williamson. I'm the founder of the ACBAC organization here in Alamance County. Um, over the past few years, our organization has fought a respectable, respectful and honorable battle against the tax of Southern historical monuments and symbols. There's a battle going on like none of us have ever seen before. For those of us that understand and know the truths of history, we are facing an unsure future. It is very important that our elected leaders in the community know that the recent events that transpired in Charlottesville do not lay on the backs of our county or the great state of North Carolina. I know and respect a lot of people in this county and I have in this county and I have known and I have never known or been in the presence of anybody with the affiliation of the KKK or anyone that represents the Nazi party. In today's world if you are present if you present an effort to preserve history or cling to the common morals of ethics you are labeled as a Nazi. Not only are you labeled but our police officers, our jailers, our elected leaders and our president is labeled as the KKK and Nazis. Even though I was not included in the events that transpired on Saturday night, I watched through social media that our mo that I watched through social media that those that want our monuments to be removed were all shouting that we were the KKK or the Nazis. That is not the case and never will be the case. No Southern man that stands behind the truths of Southern history will ever stand stand beside a man holding a Nazi symbol. The men and women that hold these monuments, our Confederate monuments, dear to our hearts, cherish them for no reason other than pride and honor of the sons and fathers that answered the call to defend their homes, their families, and their rights. To me personally, I know each and every inch of my family history, and I have eight, eight links of Confederate ancestors, not, one, only, not but only one owned a slave. You can Google and read reconstructed history all you please, but knowing the truth, and why these monuments were erected has nothing to do with slavery, oppression, or race. Our monuments are no different than a grave marker for the sons and fathers that did not return home from the battles that they believed to be worthy of the cause. From the beginning of time, all history has its good and bad parts. If we're going to let slavery be the case to erase or change history, then we need to have a travel ban on Turkey and Iran for importing slaves from white slaves from Russia. How about the Christian slave trade to Muslim Spain that lasted for nearly 600 years? What about the mention of slavery in the Holy Bible? Do we rewrite the Bible? Better yet, if someone does not like the teachings of the Holy Bible, do we erase it also? Where and what with does it end? And is that it? Thank you, Gary. Thank you. All right, next, uh, David Malik. I can get up without my knees, but <laughs> I can relate to that. 
Well, I, you know, I, I can't say much better than this gentleman that spoke before me, um, but uh, I think he stole some of my notes. <laughs> uh, I would like to say that's the reason I came up here tonight, was I wanted to petition you honorable people that are here, uh, consider Southern feelings as well as others. You know, we're a nation of mixed people, and sometimes it's hard to get along. But if this whole nation was totally white, or if all the Africans, of, I mean, people of African descent, went back to Africa and lived among only black people, there would still be problems. And that's one of the worst things that I've seen happening in my lifetime as a boy. Growing up in the South, I've never hated a black person because of the color of their skin. I've liked a lot of black people. So let me qualify that right up front, that I'm not here because I'm prejudiced about anything, but my great-grandfather was a Confederate soldier. And I was proud of that because my opinion of his fight was for his rights. I don't know what his rights were. I wasn't there. He was dead long before I came along. But I'm, I'm really concerned about our monument. I want it to stay. It reminds me that I got a little rebel in me. You know, we all want to kind of be independent. We all have a little rebel in us, even the ladies. Uh, and I think that that's one of the things I wanted to mention was that the divorce rate in this country is so high because everybody has an opinion and they want to stand on that opinion because they believe in it. And so men and women get divorces. They say, well, they don't do it the way I want them to do it and I just can't live with them no more. And I'm asking you people here tonight to support keeping our monument. I heard that Governor Cooper was considering trying to find a way to get rid of our monuments. And I thought, man, if they'd call up a militia, I'd love to join. Because I just, I can't stand it. It breaks my heart that my history has to be lied about and degraded by people that really don't know what they're talking about. And I'm not talking about... Uh, the Honorable uh, Governor Cooper. I, I'm just talking about the average citizen. So if you would, please consider my feelings and, and obviously this gentleman's feelings when he was speaking. He was right on. You know, I, I, I'm not about hate. I don't hate anybody. I profess to be a Christian and Jesus tells us to love other people. And I care about other people's feelings. But I want them to care about mine, too. There's got to be a little equality here. <clears throat> thank you, sir. All right, thank, thank you. you. Is it Donise Freeman? Hey. Uh, mm, excuse me. I'd like to speak on a couple of different things. First, I am UDC, uh, a member. My great-grandfather also served. Uh, actually, I have most of my family ancestors have served in military of all types and all wars but I want to elaborate on something I was privy to last weekend I was in Charlottesville last weekend with a group of people that was with e neither side we went into with the uh, permission with the police department we provided medical service for both both sides we were right in between them. we had to watch both to make sure we didn't get attacked the violence that was in that town is something this town truly does not want to get involved in. I am awake to everything that's going on in this country. I make it my business to know what's going on around me. And it even scarred me. I promise you, I will never forget last week. Uh, this really is very, very important. We need to be considerate of everybody's feelings. I understand that. But I don't think in this county we have a big issue, and I don't want it to get to that point. I'm sorry. That's my fault. But uh, I really want y'all to consider keeping our statue. It's very important to so many of us, our ancestry. I'm not only white. 
I have Native American and black in my ancestry. I've tracked it all the way back to when we came over on the Mayflower. I'm not only just an uh, Alamance County citizen, <coughs> I'm also part of a way bigger uh, network of people. But anyway, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bradley Dixon. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm an advocate of the monument. Uh, my name is Bradley Dixon. Um, I'm a 10th generation uh, resident of Alamance County. Um, of course, uh, back then it wasn't Alamance County, it was, it was Orange. Um, Simon Dixon is my sixth great grandfather. He was the founder of Snow Camp. Uh, he was also one of a dozen or so families that came to this area in the mid 1700s. Um, he was a Quaker, he was a Christian, he had very strong values, very strong Christian values, very strong morals. Um, he died in Mevin, modern day Mevin. Um, none of my ancestors ever had slaves. Um, that's something that you will, you will not hear from uh, other people. The history books may tell you different, but none of mine owned slaves. Um, my ancestors that did fight in the Civil War fought to protect the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment, and the same uh, reason we should protect it today. Um, the, the powers that were given to the federal government, excuse me, the powers that were not specified by the Constitution uh, to go to the federal government were to go to the states. And that was being overrun at the time. And that's, that was a, a major reason of secession from the Civil War which did take a while, it didn't go through the first time as you would remember from history class. Um, James Emsley Job, born in uh, 1826, he was my fourth great grandfather. He fought in the Civil War. He was in the 53rd North Carolina Infantry uh, Company F. That statue represents his life and his service. And my, the, my family's uh, <coughs> sacrifice for him to go off to the war. Um, they saw some terrible things. The, this, the monument needs to stay. It, it, it signifies the horrible things that they saw. Not only did they see you know, their friends torn to pieces, they had to watch them decompose. It's just, it was terrible. I'm proud of my family and the, the, the work that they did in the war. Um, I am a uh, fireman in uh, Alamance County. I, I see a lot of blood. I've noticed one thing doesn't matter what color your skin is the blood is always going to be red always and I'll, I'll uh, close on this note uh, in Genesis God said that or the Bible says that um, he made man in the image of God and a racist would not say this the if the face of God is as beautiful as the face of all these humans in this room and in this world then my God is beautiful, so that means that every human is beautiful. That's all i got to say. Thank you. Walter Allison. Good evening. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, mine is different. I didn't come for the, I was completely blown away about what's going on here this evening. Uh, I'm here to let you all know that I belong to the Alamance County Human Relations Commission, and we've been a, doing a study on students facing homelessness. This is Alamance County statistics. Okay, did you know that in, tw in the 2016-17 school year, there were more than 500 homeless students in the Alamance Broughton school system? And what I'm here today is to invite each and every one of you to our forum uh, on September the 14th at lunchtime. It's going to be from 12.30 to 2.30, and it's going to be at the... Um, 
Crump Village Educational Center. Uh, we would love to have you there. And please, if you can, please be there. It's at Crump Village Educational Center, and it's about homeless students in Alamance County. That's all I got. I got a happy end. Yes, well, thank did. you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for advocating. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, that seems to be all of our speakers. Uh, Commissioner responses. Well, I do have some things to say about the monument. Um, I was thinking about saving them till the end, but um, I guess I'll go ahead and do it now. So if folks want to leave and not have to sit through the rest of the meeting, that would be fine. Um, some people, obviously, clearly, well, they didn't come tonight or speak tonight, but some people don't like our monument because they say it honors a civilization that was built on cruelty, white supremacy, yes. the institutional exploitation of people based on race. And all decent people abhor those things, as I do, and therefore the monument, they say, should come down even if unlawfully and by force. Doing things unlawfully and by force is never the right answer. If the monument were ever to be moved or removed, it must be done after the appropriate political process has been seen to. Otherwise, anarchists and bullies get their way. That is forcing one point of view on others without following the law and thus just as un-American as racism and white supremacy. It's ruled by mob and I do not support that. I promise you that if anything happens to that monument unlawfully, I will vote to restore it and replace it right where it is now. I hope that people who would consider coming to this county and destroying our county's property would consider the financial cost to Alamance County. If we do that, it takes money away from the schools um, and other important county programs. Anyone who really cares about the health and well-being, the future of Alamance County will want to avoid spending money on fixing the monument or replacing it. So I ask people who are watching or listening tonight to please leave the monument alone so we don't have to spend that money to fix and replace it. And also, please consider the security needs of the rest of the county. Our Sheriff's Department has been taking a lot of time to, to um, protect county property, and um, we need to allow our Sheriff's Department to do their normal work of patrolling our roads and seeing that all of our citizens are, are safe. So um, I've got other things I could say, but I think that that's enough for now. That's so. very good. Bob? Well, I appreciate what Amy just said, and I agree that um, I'm certainly not in favor of any unlawful removal or, or destroying the monument, that we need to be, we need to follow the laws. Uh, what was done in Durham was not right. Um, at the same time, what was done in Charlotte wasn't right either, and I abhor the, any bigotry and racism and and uh, I mean, I understand that. Uh, where's Gary? That uh, from Hackback. Um, I mean, I I hear what you said that you're not KKK and you're not Nazis, and so I appreciate you saying that. Um, two years ago, uh, this issue was pretty hot, and uh, when it was suggested that somebody was going to ask us to remove the monument, which by the way is not on tonight's agenda, and we have no power to remove yeah, the monument. It's a state uh, that was taken away from us by the state uh, general assembly a couple of years ago, which I disagree with that. I think this should be a local decision. Every community needs to decide for themselves and go through a process. But my uh, position at that time was that the monument doesn't need to be removed, at least at the current time. And I continue to uh, hold that position because I think that the monument is when, when I said two years ago, it's a symbol. And we've heard examples tonight uh, of what a valuable symbol that is to uh, the people who spoke. Uh, it's a symbol of heritage and honor and valor and, and various things. To other, it's a symbol of racism and a symbol of hatred. And I mean, I, and I appreciate those views as well. But I think regardless of what the symbol means, it's more important that we address uh, the underlying issues of racism and racial disparities. And when you look in our country, in our society, we have great disparities in education, in health care, 
in criminal justice, just about every system that we have in our society, there's great racial disparities. And we need to figure out how to reduce those and eliminate those and spend our energies doing that. And it could be a time after we look at racism and racial disparities that we as a community might decide it's better to put that monument some other place. Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, I see head shaking and, you know, that's, that's fine. And this is what we have uh, discourse about. Um, so over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've read a lot of things on both sides of this issue, reasons why monuments, monuments should be moved and reasons why they should stay. Uh, lots of different perspectives about the actual history of the Civil War and, and the erecting of the monuments to begin with. I mean, it's all over the map. I, I'm one that likes to seek truth, and so I'm always seeking uh, truth, and sometimes truth can be elusive. Um, but uh, so I'm not going to really talk about some of the things I've been reading about that maybe brings a little bit different perspective. But I will say this, <laughs> that um, so I graduated from Duke University graduate school. So I'm on the mailing list of the uh, Duke University. Lots of things that come out from Duke I get. And, and I got a statement this past week from the president of Duke. And, and I just love what he said. This is what he said. We have a responsibility to come together as a community, determine how we can respond to this unrest in a way that demonstrates our firm commitment to justice, not discrimination, to civil protest, not violence, to authentic dialogue, not rhetoric, and to empathy, not hatred. So this is, this is kind of how I feel about it today. And so my position really from two years ago hasn't changed, um, but I am uh, want to reflect and, and learn more. Uh, the last year or so, I've been a student of racism and, and uh, racial equity and uh, how systemic racism is alive and well today, as it has been throughout the history of this country. And uh, so I'd like to see that ceased. So that's where I am on the issue. Very good. Well, I'm going to say something, but I'm not going to take as long as Bob does. Uh, <laughs> I'm these, sorry. These monuments was erected decades ago, and from these, from these monuments, they reflect our history and our culture. For good or bad, it is, history is what it is. Agreed. Tim. Well... I've been looking forward to this to be quite honest about it. Uh, <clears throat> I have to come in about Duke. I've seen that statue of Robert E. Lee for years in the portal there at Duke. Yes, it was damaged disgracefully. And to think that somebody believes that our government needs to be treated with that type of uh, dark of night hammering of Lee's head Yes, they had to take it down and repair it. I, I, I agree with that, but what they want to do is put it down and put it in a museum so they can talk about it rather than repair it and put it back. So I vehemently disagree with what Duke's doing uh, in the long run. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm a charter member of the Sons of the Confederacy in this town. We met at Rich's Cafe the night charter night I paid my twenty dollars or whatever I paid and I signed up went to a lot of their meetings uh, my great-grandfather's name is supposed to be in the base of that in a box I've never seen it obviously but he was mustered out of here along with the other 1100 or so served four years captured twice Paroled in Greensboro at the end of the war, had to make his mark that he wouldn't take up arms against the government. I'm not ashamed of that, not in the least. I'll never vote to do anything to take that statue or monument away from here for whatever reason. I agree totally with Amy. It comes down, it goes back up, as far as I'm concerned. They took the one down in Reedsville after a car hit it, which is down in a circle about a half a block away from the florist that does my wife's flowers. And they took the remains and 
they rebuilt it and stuck it in a cemetery. You know, I've heard these arguments. Well, you know, we're real concerned about the monument. You know, we're so glad it's not been defaced after Durham, and we don't want to see that happen here. Maybe we should move it. Now, that's the biggest red herring <laughs> argument I've ever heard in my life. You know what happened when it got to Reedsville, the Reedsville monument, when it rebuilt it? It was defaced. It was vandalized when it got to the cemetery. Uh, I had this made and, and I hope we can learn from this maybe not <coughs> maybe I'm wrong but I don't think I am this is all political correctness run amok to heck with the facts and emotions have just gone haywire I couldn't find my book I've got books everywhere, two different states, as a matter of fact, and I don't know where this book is. But this is a cover of a book that was done by Jerry Bledsoe, who had been with the Greensboro News Record. <coughs> it's called Death by Journalism, One Teacher's Fateful Encounter with Political Correctness, Jerry Bledsoe. Have you ever read the book? No. You need to. Jerry Bledsoe had been with the News and Record and got into it with him basically and he, he's one of the finest authors I've ever known of on, on local stories. He had a New York Times bestseller number one about the deal in Greensboro where a couple blew up their van of two children and a, a boy and a girl because she thought her ex-husband was going to steal the children. I forgot the name of that book. But he, Bitter blood? Yeah, bitter blood. And Jerry and I have talked over the years about a deal about the uh, courthouse shootout up in Hillsville, Virginia, and I put him on the details about that case. And he finally, he backed off of the story. But uh, long story short, I know Jerry enough to say I've talked to him and I can call him. And this book was about a professor at Randolph Community College. He was teaching a war on the Civil War. Teach a class on the Civil War. And the Greensboro News and Record heard about it, so they went to him, and he was very nice. The professor was considered to be a pillar in the community. Quite a professor. People loved him. Hardly right wing. And they went to him, and they said, can we sit in on your class? He said, sure. You're welcome. They went back to Greensboro and wrote the most yellow stories, yellow journalism, trying to depict him as a racist, trying to depict his offerings in the classroom as racism, and falsely rip, represent, misrepresenting what he was doing in that class. He couldn't believe it. And they kept coming back with the articles. Well, the college, in an effort to sort of calm the storm, canceled the class. And right after that class, he died of a heart attack. And his wife said the stress of what was going on and what the paper was doing to him caused him to have the heart attack. Who knows? But I believe it. The book is stunning. In Bledsoe's book, Death by Journalism, his encounter with political correctness, that's what's going on all across this country. It's going on locally, in the state, and in Washington, around the world. Uh, I'm not going to be a victim of political correctness. I'm just not going to do it. And uh, label me all you want. Say what you will about me. Pro or con. Doesn't bother me. But I'm not ashamed that my great-grandfather <coughs> did what he did. And he came back, died at age 38. And it's my belief he died of what took place during the war as far as his injuries. And he was in the hospital a couple of times. But it's my understanding when he died, that Sarah, my great-grandmother, that some guys on the farm, now you could call them slaves if you want to, but I would just call them workers, that they raised a good bit of my family out there at Altamaha Ossipee. And that when the time came, my great-grandmother gave them land. I don't know what ever took place after that. They didn't leave me any. But the bottom line is, I'm not going to be a part of a... Uh, an assault on logic, an assault on the history of this country and, and the heritage of this area and this country 
uh, and, and change an opinion that I've got about it due to political correctness. Not going to do it. And I would challenge you to read the book. And anybody. Death by journalism, Jerry Bledsoe. That's all i got to say. Thank you, sir. Can I say one more thing? Sure. I think <coughs> it won't take a long time. Please. Because um, some of you all, some people have reflected on whether or not they have family who's specifically honored or included in the monument. And I just wanted to mention for a public record that, to my knowledge, I do not. I do have a Scott ancestor. The Scots came here, as far as I know, in the 1730s. And um, I do have, you know, obviously there were Scots living in Alamance County during that time. Henderson Scott was my great great grandfather, <clears throat> um, and he did not serve in the Civil War. He was in far, he had an ankle problem. Um, it is notable to me I, that, to my knowledge, I might be wrong about this, but I think I'm right. Henderson, Henderson Scott's grandson was the governor of North Carolina who appointed the first African-American to a judgeship in North Carolina. So um, that's my family's uh, tradition with that or family history with that. And I also wanted to say, you know, I know that folks talk a lot about what the monument means. I wanted to share what it means to me personally. What, I, what do I think when I see the monument? And I think about the cost of war. To me, it's a monument to peace. Is something that should remind us that the common man fights the war. The, the fellows who drafted and were served in that, in that army, many of them, maybe any of them did it because they wanted to, many of them did it because they didn't see a choice. <coughs> and that's the same as it is through all the wars in United States history. And when I see that gray pillar out there in front of the courthouse, I think about the fellows in the foxholes, the fellows in the um, in the rice paddies. I think about the men and, and women now in the desert. I think about um, the trenches and the woods, all the places that our people have fought in American history because people had to do their duty. I have a son who in a year will be uh, 18 years old, and uh, he will sign up for the selective service. And then, you know, like all the other mothers, in our country, I have to think about, you know, what if my son gets drafted? Do I want some people 150 years from now judging my family and judging me because my son did what he felt like he had to do? And that's what I think about when I see the monument. I don't see, a te you know, a, a, something that honors racial division, something that honors slavery. I see something that reminds me that war is devastating and costly and lives are precious and we should think very seriously about those things before we get involved in wars so i just want to share that very good a lot of good comments um didn't know we were going to spend that much time on talking about it but i think it's worthwhile because what i hear tonight is civility from the folks that have come and spoke and i think that's what we've got to have and our sheriff's got a lot better things to do than go over and guard that monument on a Saturday night. So, um, <laughs> hopefully, the people of Alamance County will respect that, and and we'll move on with life, and things will change. All right. Uh, next, uh, need approval for our agenda. So moved. Thank you, Bill. Second. Thank you, Bob. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Uh, consent agenda, is there anything on there anyone would like to pull? I move approval of the consent agenda. All right. Second. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Amy. All in favor? Aye. 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 And our first presentation will be from Todd Thorpe, Assistant Superintendent of the ABSS. Good evening, Commissioners. How are we doing? Hey, good, sir. Evening. Good, good to see you. Good to be here. You know, it's always good to wake up and put your feet on the floor in the mornings. Uh, I bring to you a lot of requests for $78,000, uh, ranging anywhere from ADA issues to parking lot stripes to engineering services for roof evaluations to some more carpet removal and tile installations. Um, Dr. Thorpe, I have just a couple of questions. Um, sure. 
Well, one is uh, just kind of a remark. I think for the engineering services roof evaluation, is that $25,000? There were some questions about that at the school board meeting. Yes, ma'am. Is that right? And I just wanted to, you know, say here where it's appropriate that I think it's pretty obvious that you have to get those roofs evaluated as part of your litigation. Then y'all are going to come. I, I assume that that fee will be included in the cost of your damages that you'll be seeking from the roofing company. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know if the other commissioners are aware, but there's a problem with a, how many yeah, roofs? I'll give you just a brief history. Okay. okay. We got six roofs that were put on about 13 years ago. It's a TPO roof. Uh, it was Stevens Roofing, uh, Dow Roofing or Dow Chemical bought them out years ago. Uh, the warranties are still active and good. Uh, matter of fact, even their attorneys came out and tried to find a reason to void the warranties and said no, we had maintained the roofs as we had said, as we had agreed to. But the material is into an absolute uh, failure at this point. Uh, if you know anything about TPO roof, it is a layer of plastic, like a layer of cheesecloth and a layer of plastic for lack of you know, better description. Well, undoubtedly the um, UV protection or something in the top layer is not right because the top layer is now pretty much missing in the large areas. So you've, the material's broken down. Uh, up until about eight months ago, nine months ago, we could call the company, we could send in the paperwork, they came out, they patched. No problem, your roof's fixed. Well, now the patches are failing. So it forced us to get attorneys involved and Excuse me, but you, when attorneys get involved, we slow the process down a little bit. Uh, about this? <laughs> <laughs> you just got the wrong one. I got the wrong one here. Okay, I can't argue with this one. We can talk about that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it does slow the process down sometimes. So actually, our attorneys, I think, have done very well. We've pushed hard for eight months. We're hoping for a settlement pretty soon. Uh, we have now had everything evaluated. We have got the pictures, we've got the core samplings, we've got everything done. The our attorneys gave me permission as of Friday to do what I had to necessary to try to patch these roofs, which means we'll go, th go to things outside of what the warranty would normally cover because that claim has now been filed. So we are now looking to do what we can do to seal the roofs the best we can until we can get a settlement. When we get a settlement, of course, you know, I'm going to be back here, you know, talking with y'all about how do we proceed because this is 13 years into a 15 year warranty. I don't know, you know, what the final settlement will be. Was but it prorated warranty or? So that's a yes, no, they, they try to prorate it. Uh, I know you know, Wake County had the same issue, I think five years ago and our uh, same group of attorneys represented them and they came out with a pretty good settlement. So we're hoping and shooting for a good settlement on these roofs. When we do, of course, you know, this isn't a home structure. It'll take me three months from the date that I get the money to the date we get everything settled, so I get engineering services. Of course, it'll have to go out to public bid because we're talking a little over half a million dollars per roof. Uh, get it out the bid, get it back in. Kids will be in the building, so we'll have to do creative construction, as I call it. You know, we'll have to do night evenings, uh, do as much as we can during the day, probably use an adhesive instead of a hard fastener on them, which I mean, it's the same either way. Uh, just keep the noise level down, but these decks have got to, these roofs have got to come all the way back down to the decking, which is the metal that the roof sets on. Uh, so it's going to be a pretty intense process. So you still have to build it up just like you did originally? Yes, sir, because the insulation is about 70% wet yeah. in most buildings. So we will go through that long process to make that happen. Uh, the purpose for engineering services is to help us defend that it's not our problem, that it's a material problem, and to the extent of damage that's done to our buildings. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, which schools are we talking about? Which schools are affected? Okay, we've got Broadview. It's the Cummins campus. We count two buildings in Cummins because you've got Cummins and you got the Fine Arts Building. Graham Middle School. Sellers Gun still has uh, two sections. And Ian e. Holt has about 15,000 square feet in this TPA roof. Uh, E.M. Holtz actually holding up fairly decent, knock on wood, <laughs> uh, but the rest of them are in pretty much catastrophic failure at this point. Now I got a call last week about uh, the roof situation with a lot of concern about whether the school is going to be ready. I guess the, the teachers went back today and the children go back Monday. Can you tell us about what's being done to get ready for the school year? In 27 years I've not missed a year of opening the schools. Uh, they will open. 
what we've done is, you know, unfortunately with everything that's going on with attorneys involved and the whole process, over the summer there's a lot of ceiling tiles that have gotten wet. And instead of just putting new tiles up, let them keep getting wet, new tiles up, keep getting them wet, we've got some that are, we've got some mold growth on some, mold spore growth on some. <coughs> But for the most part, if you know a ceiling tile, when it gets wet, it turns gray and turns brown. We got a lot looking bad. So we're going to go in since I've had a roof on the building all day today. At Broadview, we're going to go in and tear out all the tiles that are bad, replace them back with tiles, and then we'll continue to monitor that and make sure you know, we don't have any leaks or any leaks of substantial, uh, the substantial damage. Any mold or anything that we've noticed anywhere. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this time of year in our buildings, Mold can become an issue because we don't. Years ago, when we put chiller systems in, in buildings, there was no fresh air returns put in. So buildings get it cold. You have condensation. So sweat. our custodians sweats. Yeah, the sweat. So our custodians have to work extremely hard on making sure window sills are wiped out, and you know we take care of those issues. But we will be ready. Uh, I've got a team coming in tomorrow. We're putting in about 400 tiles. When I say we, I'm there with them because. <laughs> We're in crunch time. This is my work week. I, I put this shirt on to come to the meeting. Uh, <laughs> I sympathize with you. I was over the roofs at Laurel Art Tobacco Companies, so I know I've been there. It's a challenge some it's days. It's a challenge. And you may I want spend to pray a lot for of some dry weather. The rest oh, only sunny days. Dry. I love it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we will be ready. We will take care of it. Um, the kids will be fine. Uh, we will do any type of... What we do is if somebody calls and says there's some sort of they feel like there's something affecting them in any way, we'll go into an air quality test, run air quality, you know, which checks any spores in the air, checks any contaminants in the air. Um, if Is that they are, a third party that does that? Or? We've, we've done it ourselves and we have called in third parties. If we do it ourselves and the issue doesn't seem to be resolved, we'll bring a third party in. Uh, and then we, we will remediate or do what we have to do to make sure everything's safe, everything's good for our children. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't see everything every day, so when it's reported, we try to move quickly to make sure that everyone's safety is taken. I've specifically been asked about AO with the mold issues there. Are there any mold issues that you, or any concerns that you have about mold at AO uh, elementary school? I actually called my safety, environmental safety guy, uh, and we were talking a little bit. We usually talk about once every two or three weeks about schools that see issues. At AO, there's no issues that's been noted. Um, I do tell all the folks this, and don't feel like they're tattling or whatever else. If someone has a problem, email me, call me. You got to um, know about it before you can repair that's it. Right. That's correct. If, if they do, that's right. yeah, I never, uh, and I'll say this publicly because some people think if I hear about it, I run to my boss, oh my God, so and so. No, no, no. We just take care of the issue and move on because it's an issue. Whether it's real or perceived, it's an issue, and we need to deal with it. And, uh, sometimes people just need, when something happens, they need somebody to go and do a, a thorough cleaning in the room, you know, to get rid of dust or whatever else. And we've done that. We've done weekend stuff. Uh, I've painted rooms on weekends. So, you know, we, we'll do what we have to. But if someone says something, please ask them just to email me or shoot me a text or call me or, and we'll get on. All right. Thank you for um, answering those questions and for being here tonight. I make a motion that we approve the lottery fund request. I'll second that. Before we yeah. vote, I had some questions yeah. I want to oh, ask. I'm sorry. It has sure. nothing to do with the vote. I support that. Okay. Are these all flat roofs? Were yes, sir. They were all yes, sir. They're all flat roofs. They're all just they, and they feed into drain systems instead right. of feeding into the gutter system. So they are flat roofs feeding into drains. What kind of square foot cost do you get on repairs uh, commercially? On repairs or to, on replacement? Well, both. Uh, okay, Broadview is about 100 square foot. 100,000 square feet. Uh, the roof is projected to cost about $560,000. We'll say $5 square foot? Yeah, $5, 5 $6 square foot. <coughs> Repairs normally come to us between 4 and $6 a square foot, depending on if it's around skylights right. or if it's just open flat area. Right. Sounds pretty standard. Yeah, it's pretty much industrial standards. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all so much for all your right. support. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Next, Libby Hodges. We have a request to set a public hearing for flood damage prevention ordinance. Good evening, Commissioners. 
Um, make sure y'all can hear me. So I'm here tonight uh, to ask for you all to set a public hearing uh, for revisions to the floodplain management, the flood damage prevention ordinance. Um, these um, changes have been offered by the state. Um, I've actually prepared a short uh, presentation if you're interested in that. I don't know how in-depth you want to go today. Yeah, I think, we, I think we need to see that. Okay. okay. Um, I've also got um, the annotated version of the ordinance uh, with all the changes marked on it. If y'all want to go through item by item, uh, that's fine as well. It just might be a little long. Um, so Scott's got us queued up. Cheer. Is it working? Excellent. So, uh, short history, uh, NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, was created in 1968. Uh, there's been a couple of amendments through the years. Uh, basically, in 1994, they further strengthened it. Uh, and they require in that act uh, that flood maps be reviewed every five years uh, for compliance and accuracy. So. As part of that, the North Carolina Department of Public Safety has become a cooperating technical partner. So what that means is that they are allowed to review and update the, the FEMA maps and the firm maps, the flood insurance rate maps um, that insurance companies and FEMA uses to underwrite uh, flood insurance policies. Um, so. Back to the beginning, our flood damage prevention ordinance was originally passed in 1994, and participation in the program provides our citizens the opportunity to participate uh, in the FEMA flood insurance as well as um, they're usually, participation in this program is usually required for homeowners to get federally underwritten uh, mortgages. Uh, and it also allows us to access disaster assistance for natural disasters such as floods. Um, so as part of this five-year review they've come through and they've re revised our firm maps. Um, FEMA has given us the deadline of November 17th to adopt these changes and to adopt these maps. Um, we're part of a group of Alamance, Chatham, and Orange so we're all three being asked and all the jurisdictions inside of us are being asked to adopt all of these maps by November 17th. Are they asking us or demanding us to? That's the interesting <laughs> part. If you don't adopt the ordinance, they kick you out of the program. So That's not a bad idea either. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a carrot and a stick approach. Um, but if you get kicked out of the program, anyone who has a FEMA flood insurance policy is out of the program. Uh, we also would not be eligible to ask for any flood assistance or any From other FEMA, FEMA assistance mm -hmm. should any natural disasters happen. So just to be just perfect in the clear. arm and yeah. keep me in yeah. jail. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in order to reduce the burden on local government, the Department of Public Safety of North Carolina has created this uh, model ordinance. Uh, basically, their thought process <coughs> being that by creating this model ordinance, we have a pre-approved ordinance that's been approved by FEMA that we don't have to go to FEMA ourselves and become a cooperating technical partner, hire engineers, do all of the proof that we would have to do in order to do it ourselves. Um, so, like I said, it should be adopted by November 17th or we would be considered non-conforming and basically be removed from the program. Uh, the ordinance does have some items that are optional. Uh, I've taken this as part of our process for all the ordinances that the planning department does, we take it to the planning board initially and basically get their recommendation uh, to bring to the board of commissioners. Uh, so on our August 10th meeting, we did go through all of those items. Uh, I have their recommendations. That's part of the annotated list that, that you can see. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, I thought it would be good to mention that they did have a information session a few years ago about these maps and it's taken this long for us to get an official date for those maps to be adopted. Um, so at this time though, the planning department is asking that we schedule a public hearing on September 18th uh, to hear the changes to this ordinance and potentially adopt the ordinance. 
should the board so decide. Is that a, do you have any questions so far? It's, it's a lot of information and it's taken a while to get to this point. Um, Scott, can you pull up the annotated list that I sent? Um, I can have a, if you're <coughs> it, I can get to it. Sure. So it's also in your packet. It probably would be good to kind of read along as we go because it's a lot of information. Um, as part of the packet that I put together for the Board of Commissioners, there's also a copy of this adoption of flood rate insurance map by participating community. So it outlines kind of the program and it tells you at the end kind of what they expect to happen if, if these don't get adopted in time. <coughs> So the flood damage prevention ordinance, uh, it is color coded. So when, when it comes up eventually, uh, the blue text are changes from the 2007 to the 2017 version. The green text is going to be additions that are new to the 2017 version. And red text are items that have been deleted. So we'll get to that in just a second. Which one is it? Is it the, uh, it's the VOCC. Yeah. There you go. Can we make it kind of as big as possible? Without cutting out too much. Kind of hard. To I'm read. putting Scott through his paces <laughs> here. I apologize. Um, So um, as you read through the ordinance, the items that are marked as optional, it's kind of in capital letters um, in parentheses on the edge, are the items that we have an option as to how we want to proceed on those items. I'm sorry, that's not going to work much better. Um, So Scott, do you want to scroll down just a little bit? Uh, the first green text here, there is some additional language explaining the objectives of the ordinance. Uh, not terribly different than really than what we have. I don't think this is really a um, substantial change. Uh, a number of the definitions have really been clarified, basically, so it's a little easy to, easier to administer. Sometimes we have questions about what things mean and how we would apply that uh, to items. Um, there is an area of future condition flood hazard that is an optional term. It's not currently in the ordinance. The planning board recommend at including it. I haven't found a lot of language inside the ordinance that would really apply to that definition, so I'm a little unsure why it's been added and why it would be important for, it to, for us to add. Um, so that would be an optional item. <coughs> um, if we go down to the existing structure, I just in, inserted the, the date uh, that it was initially adopted. Um, keep scrolling down. There's some green added here. The flood resistant material, so it gives us a little more guidance when it comes to constructing homes, what's considered a flood resistant material. Uh, that is not an optional item. Thank you. Uh, floodway, uh, just uh, making that a little bit more clear for use. Floodway encroachment analysis. Uh, every once in a while they'll use a term mm -hmm. inside the text of the ordinance but we don't have a definition, so we don't know what that means, and we would have to use our judgment. Uh, but that is also non-optional. Uh, letter of map change, that just, uh, anytime there is construction and the floodplain changes, we do a letter of map change, so that just defines that. Uh, light duty truck is just a definition to explain what that is. remove the mean sea level. Um, we have an option for a non-conversion agreement. So that would be an agreement that would not allow, for instance, a basement area to be converted into living space if it was created um, as non-livable space when the house was built. So every here and there we have a problem with people who would 
build a house, raise it above the base flood elevation, you would have an unfinished basement underneath. And some people will go in later and convert that space and then try to file it on their insurance to try to get money for the space that's not supposed to be lived in. Um, the planning board uh, did not uh, take the option to include that uh, at this time. It's not currently in our ordinance. Uh, my, my thought or my explanation to them was when the house is built, we have those plans. We already know that's not supposed to be a finished space, so we would know that already. There's no need for us to go to the extra expense and trouble of having an agreement. Uh, it's just more work. Uh, post firm, uh, we're just inserting our dates. Uh, explains what a recreation recreational vehicle is. If this gets too dry, please stop me, because this is this is long stuff. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Sure. Are any of these changes of concern to you? Any, any of them problematic from your perspective? Uh, professionally, no. Yeah. I mean, it, it's at the board's discretion how how intensely they want to manage. We don't issue a whole lot of floodplain development permits. Uh, most people, once they find out that they need additional engineering costs, <coughs> they avoid the area, which is always our first um, recommendation: is if you don't have to, don't do it. Okay, the second question is, has this gone to the other municipalities yet? Uh, yeah. Most of them, yes. And have there been any pushback on any of the changes? Not, not that I've heard of, but I don't think most of them have adopted it yet. I think most of them have gone through their kind of first reading planning board mm -hmm. process, just like and us. And we're basically doing to set a public hearing yeah. to mm -hmm. do this. Right. right, we're just setting the... That's all I'm asking. So we got time to really study this. Yeah, to right. study it further. Yeah. If we need to. Maybe right. we don't need to take the time to go over such detail tonight. I mean, it's up to the rest right. of you. But. What's the <coughs> yard? I'd make a motion that we go ahead and set the public hearing. Okay. And what date were you wanting to do uh, that? The, the next 18th? evening meeting. I think it's the 18th. <coughs> September 18th. Okay. All right, Amy. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. And if you have any other questions in the meantime, please let me know. I'm happy to answer anything. And, and I do have a one question. Okay. Somebody called me that doing a porch edition. A what? A porch edition. Oh, okay. And they're in the 500 year flood plain. We don't regulate the 500 year flood plain. Well, inspections evidently thought they needed to. Yeah, you need to tell your inspectors. Because oh, okay. the I engineer. Got call. Yeah, they, they, they yeah, wanted to have an engineered call. footing. That's ridiculous. I think we're going to meet with that uh, individual. Uh, we're lining up a meeting <laughs> now uh, to go to talk with them. Good luck. We're taking down uh, well, planning and inspections. And that's, see yeah, if we can that, figure out what's going on. I wasn't sure about that, and I said, yeah, well, mm -mm. question that. <clears throat> Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, Susan Osborne. Proposed Justice Advisory Council. Yes. So I come to you tonight, not with my DSS hat on, but as co-chair of the Stepping Up Task Force and the Stepping Up Initiative in Alamance County. And we're bringing before you tonight a recommendation from our leadership team. Um, there are several of our leadership team members in the room with Bruton, Sheriff Johnson, Tim Britt. We have our DA. We have Commissioner Bird. Um, and this, the recommendation is to establish a Justice Advisory Council for Alamance County. And so we're asking for you, number one, to put your blessings on that. And then secondly, to be the um, appointing authority for five at-large positions on this council. And I want to tell you <coughs> just a little bit about it. But as you know, we have lots of initiatives going on in the community. And our goal is to have a high-level um, decision-maker council that would look at all criminal justice issues in Alamance County. So stepping up would be one, only one. Our Family Justice Center um, steering committee would be encompassed under this. We may have, um, as we go forward with Raise the Age initiatives in our community, as we go forward with our opioid crisis work, um, those human trafficking, those all could come under this um, Justice Advisory Council. Instead of each time we have a new initiative establishing a new committee, 
um, we have m many of the same players on these committees and so in your hand in your packet included a list of who our um, members would be and then we would have appointing asked for you to appoint the five at-large members um, that would include a representative from our local defense bar we think that's important um, also um, my list well I don't here we go um, uh, someone from a faith-based um, our faith-based community a consumer or service recipient or NAMI representative a domestic violence survivor a local psychiatrist is the five um, areas that we would like to include um, Tori has helped us some with the um, process and getting those in place it would be the um, application process that the county always already uses and it would be um, the stepping up coordinators would be responsible for the work and Tori would keep us on track so that's what I'm asking and I'll be glad and the commissioner would be an appointee as well so so it'd be five at large that this board I'm would sorry. appoint and yes. then the commissioner would also be appointed, be appointed. not considered that large but right yeah we would like for this to be a commissioner appointment right. as well in addition to the five thank you right. Bob for clarifying that and that include the the steering committee would be rounded out with I mean the advisory council would be rounded out with all of our chiefs of our local law enforcement many most of who are already on our family justice or our stepping up initiative our district attorney our magistrate's office probation and parole all those community um, correction criminal justice stakeholders Bob anything you'd like to add? well one thing uh, Susan I believe that it's uh, um, having such a, an advisory council is a requirement of the uh, Department of Justice grant that we have for the stepping up initiative and the thought was well why create another exactly. advisory council let's just use what we already have and augment it with a couple of more specialized persons that to, to help to that's right. uh, steer the stepping up initiative and we have a model that works for our child protection and fatality prevention teams that are statutorily mandated one month we work on that team works on um, protection cases the next month it works on fatality cases and so we're suggesting to do that one month this advisory council would work on stepping up issues the next month family justice center issues um, and so that we have all the same people but we would just bring the initiatives to that one group that are the decision makers in our community also includes our county manager <laughs> He needs another job. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's he does need another job. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, do I'll we make the motion we accept it? Thank you. I think it's a good idea. Thank, thank you, Bill. Commissioner Lash. A second. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Amy. All in favor of moving forward with that? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mental health contract approval. Oh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. A couple months ago, I came to the board and uh, explained that we were looking at uh, changing the way we contract our maintenance of effort funds, our mental health maintenance of effort funds. So I'm here this evening to request that you uh, consider and approve four contracts uh, between the county and four different mental health service providers using these uh, county uh, MOE funds, maintenance of effort funds. Um, these funds come from uh, when Alamance County was divested of its uh, legal uh, state given responsibility to provide mental health. Uh, we have to continue to spend uh, county dollars on mental health services at a level that was uh, comparable to that time. So since 2011, the county has been uh, giving its mental uh, MOE monies to Cardinal Innovations, and Cardinal has been contracting directly with each one of these providers. <coughs> We've been working with Cardinal over the past couple of months, uh, and they've helped us uh, build some relationships with these groups, and we are interested in contracting with them directly. The reason we are uh, interested in that is because we can bring uh, to the table with the groups uh, what's going on locally in our community when we start negotiating these contracts, put terms in them that will encourage them to meet some of the uh, issues that this uh, uh, new Jack committee may determine or that our uh, uh, citizens here uh, tell us are important to them so um, as you in your packet you'll find a copy of uh, all four of these contracts I'm not going to go over them uh, word by word by any means but I do want to just hit a few high points there are uh, four of them the total amount of MOE dollars that we have budgeted for 1718 is one million two hundred three thousand five hundred and fifty six dollars 
uh, this, these funds are in the budget. They are slated as MOE funds to be spent on mental health services. Uh, the first contract we're recommending is with RH, RHA Healthcare. That contract dollar amount is $1,085,610. RHA provides the uh, crisis center in Alamance County for folks that are experiencing mental health issues that they need immediate attention and have some uh, significant things going on. They also do uh, inmate uh, psychiatric medication evaluation and many other crisis oriented services. Uh, we have put some terms in the contract that we're proposing with RHA that will uh, encourage them to work with us toward uh, interest in the community diversion plan to help keep uh, folks with mental health issues out of our jail as well as collaborate more with uh, Cone Health and with Cardinal about uh, uh, three-way beds uh, and their availability. We also have a contract in the package for uh, between Alamance County and Cone Health Alamance Regional. That contract dollar amount is $46,000. These funds are used to help supplement the salary of two psychiatric nurses uh, that uh, work in the emergency room to evaluate uh, folks that are coming in for mental health services and are going to our emergency room. So this helps pay the salary of those, uh, of those employees to try to uh, find the right solution for folks with mental health uh, issues that are going to the emergency department. And we've put in some uh, new terms and some new uh, things we'd like for uh, Cone Health to also consider uh, making sure that uh, uh, a warm handoff is made for anybody that uh, comes there for mental health services and is not going to stay at, uh, uh, at the ED. And also uh, some language about sharing data with the county and with Cardinal um, and working and hopefully encouraging Cone to continue to work with us on our Stepping Up project. They are a partner with us there too. Third contract the, that we're proposing is with Ralph Scott Life Services. This contract is for $11,141. Uh, Ralph Scott uses these funds to transport folks uh, to Star Point Day Program uh, over off Turrentine Street, so it helps pay for folks with developmental disabilities and other mental health issues to come for daytime programs. And the final contract in the package uh, will be between Alamance County and Residential Treatment Services of Alamance, and that contract is for $6,500. And uh, uh, residential treatment have been using this funding primarily for transportation, but they are also interested in using it for uh, to help offset medication costs for a Hall Avenue uh, indigent clients, people that come there and stay with uh, folks at residential treatment, you know, have some significant medical costs. So, um, we've used this opportunity of direct contracting between Alamance County and these service providers to try to include some of these new terms in these contracts that we think will help help our citizens. Uh, we are also including uh, Alamance County retaining $54,305 for our own local stepping up initiative. Uh, one thing we hope to possibly be able to do with these funds is use them to uh, uh, hire a stepping up coordinator once this grant expires. And the uh, folks that are doing that now part time, they will, they will, uh, those funding will go away with the grant. There could be a use of them. Uh, these funds, uh, the fifty-four thousand uh, dollars, the total of all these contracts and the stepping up funds equals one million two hundred three thousand five hundred and fifty-six uh, dollars. The four contracts are only for the remainder of this fiscal year, so they will expire again uh, July one. So they're only for the rest of the year. Uh, we will. Uh, uh, revisit these contracts and renewing them, renewing them with these providers through the budget process. So once we get back into doing budget again, we'll be sending out proposals to these folks and uh, handle all this through uh, the budget. I do want to thank uh, the folks from Cardinal. We have Rick Bruton uh, here tonight. I saw Rick. Uh, appreciate Rick. They've worked with us and they've been paying these providers for the past two months until we can get the contracts prepared and get before you tonight. So we appreciate their help. These have uh, also, all these contracts have been reviewed by a group that includes uh, Susan Osborne of DSS, uh, Stacy Saunders with the health department, myself, uh, the two stepping up coordinators, Commissioner Bird sat in on that too, and Rick from Cardinal. So there's been eyes on these contracts. We feel like they are viable, and we hope that uh, you will approve them tonight. So at this point, I will try to answer any questions that you have. If I cannot, I know there's several folks here that uh, have much more expertise in mental health than I do. questions comments it'll give us a lot more flexibility moving forward as we want to change priorities on how we spend our money Cardinal's been saying all along how do you want us to spend your money and we kind of I don't know but now we have some ideas and it just makes more sense for us to do it directly as opposed to going through Cardinal 
Well, if it works, why not do it, right? <laughs> That's it. Any other questions about it? Motion to? No, I'll make the motion that we All right. approve Thank the you. contracts. Thank you, Bob. I'll second. Thank you, Amy. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed, none. Thank you very much. All right. It's kind of an after the fact question, but I wouldn't, wouldn't have altered my boat. But did we get into the schools at all with uh, any, of, uh, any of our efforts here? With the, with the local funds? Right. Not to my knowledge. Um, there's some other state funded Medicaid services that are in schools. Do you think that's adequately covered? I would think there's always an opportunity to do more. And it, it depends greatly on the school about who they allow in and what you know, instructional daytime they give to people to be in there. But I think it's, a, my opinion, is a captive place that you have people, and uh, I think it would be good to have more availability. Yeah, you know, there's it is. This has a lot to do, kind of, with what you're here for about the homeless children. But I've seen students that are in in, in the schools that are given every sign in the world that they've got a problem. And people are taking it as if it's normal. I had a girl that was in my car, and I couldn't help but look at her left arm, and it was cut just mm -hmm. repeatedly with a razor blade. And she was trying to cover it up. And I've seen this more than once. And I felt like I had to do what I had to do. And I went to the counselor, and I said, look, you know, I'm not, I don't work here, but this is what I saw. And if it's a student of mine, I'd definitely be in here, and I'm in here now. And, and in all honesty, they were just flipping through a sales paper, looking down at it and saying, oh, well, she's a cutter. And I thought, a what? Yeah, right As if it was normal. <coughs> and, you know, there's all kind of explanations as to why, they, but they're literally taking razor blades and going like this on their arms, and it's, it's a badge of honor with some of them. It's a... Uh, uh, Again, a, a, an attention seeker, they claim. But then I heard last week of where one committed suicide. And suicides in our, in our schools are, are more prevalent than maybe not in Alamance County, maybe not in wherever, but you're hearing more about it now than you've ever heard about kids that are just throwing up their hands or they're being told by their friends there's nothing to live for, they're, they're, they're certain persuasions. and. There's so many signs that our kids are having so many problems. I just wonder if our if our if our school system is involved in identifying these problems and getting with the the officials that need to be gotten with. Now the particular one I went in on, uh, they basically asked me, "What would you do? What do you want us to do?" I said, "Well, for goodness sakes, I hope you know her. You know, can you contact her mother? Possibly." And they did call her mother and found out that her mother said, "Yes, we know about it." And she's seeking help. We're seeking help because of it. But it was almost a lack, like a daisical attitude of they do this. Tim, Rather that, than that, that wasn't an Alamance County experience. I mean, uh, not that it could be, but it, no, but it wasn't in Guilford where I'm at a lot either. But I know about it. I know about the case, and I just believe there's more going on with our youth, and then and I don't know if it's being identified properly. And I'm sorry if I'm bothering you with these questions, but you know I, I just love our kids too much not to identify problems that I think are existing. So, Commissioner Sutton, I'll just add um, the contract that um, the manager just referred to at RHA for the crisis program. That's where um, our schools refer kids, and they're seen immediately, and um, they're transitioned into treatment and. I was looking at some figures as we were doing these contracts and they had received 70 referrals from the school in a month's period. So that, that is something that this contract <coughs> will does support and it is um, used re readily. In, do you think that's the tip of the iceberg or is that, do you think that's got it covered or? Oh uh, well, um, I, I don't know that we've done any kind of needs assessment, but yeah. I do know that there's um, a portal and it, folks at the school system are aware of it and they're using it. Now, do we need to do more awareness? I'm, I'm with Rick. We probably do. Sure. But, um, and, I, there is some yeah. services. and I hope we do more. Yes, sir. You know, I, just to, to augment what you're talking about, I mean, it's a serious problem. And at the, um, and I'm going to report more about this under Commissioner's comments, but for now, let me just focus in on this one. I was at the uh, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners Conference last week. <laughs> And our, our guest speaker uh, during the Saturday morning session uh, that was in a room full of youth 
the four H'ers from across the state, including the uh, young lady Zoe, uh, Zoe who was, got her picture taken with us a few meetings ago. Um, we heard uh, Sue Keeble, who was the mother of Dylan Keeble, who was one of the Columbine shooters back in the 90s, mm. yeah. who, who killed all those kids. And I mean, it was heart wrenching to hear her speak. Uh, how they missed some sign, very subtle signs of mental illness that this child was um, experiencing, but it just went unnoticed. There, nothing was done, and and he ended up killing all these people, and he got killed himself. I mean, and and not to mention all the descriptions of the people that were maimed and just an awful <coughs> situation. So mental, mental illness is something we all need to pay attention to. Um. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to be making a presentation to the, to the school board on the stepping up initiative. Uh, <coughs> it's absolutely correct. And if we can reach them, even at that level, then we're going to stop our jail from being full. I get the right medication and treatment, so I commend y'all. That's good. Uh, Very good. Cardinal Innovations has just completed some training with our school personnel on mental health first aid as well. Some good moves. Yes, sir. All right. Next, uh, Debbie Hatfield with Emergency Management. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I come to you tonight asking for your permission to uh, accept a grant from North Carolina Emergency Management. It's for $1,000. It's towards our LEPC, and we can utilize that money for training or, you know, anything like that, an exercise. We uh, have already scheduled a workshop for September the 6th. We'll have a speaker come in to talk to us about wildland land fires and what they learned up in the Gatlinburg and, and the northern they had a lot of experience. They it? had a lot of experience. <laughs> Unfortunately. So, and this, this is 100% and we don't have like to pay anything. All right. I'll make the motion. Thank you, Bill. I'll second. second. Thank you all. Thank you, Bob. All in favor? All right. All right. All right. Thank you, Debbie. Um, <coughs> county manager's report. Uh, the other thing I had, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, several uh, meetings ago we had an individual come in expressing concerns about uh, grass clippings in the road and uh, danger that poses to motorcyclists and bicyclists and uh, this time I'd like to ask I think uh, Scott or uh, is going to uh, present uh, our response to that and, uh, so Scott Ward. Good evening commissioners. Good evening. Good evening Scott. Um, I had no idea uh, when when this issue first came up yeah I, I, I'm not a motorcycle rider I'm, I uh, me on a bicycle would like a, look, look like a bowling ball balanced on a toothpick um, I had no idea I drive my car down the road see grass clippings it's no big deal having the opportunity to, to research this issue with Michelle uh, with our interns that, that have been working in her office uh, I, I learned a lot and learned how dangerous something like this can be. Uh, so we got the video together. We got a uh, uh, one of our interns to to be in front of the camera. We got our my direct supervisor, Paul Boback, upstairs. Uh, he brought out his Victory motorcycle, and uh, we did this. It's just a short little one minute commercial that we hope to have on the Peg Channel uh, and out on YouTube hopefully later tonight, but we wanted you guys to have the opportunity to, uh, to see our work. Very good. As we close out our summer months, it's a beautiful time to be out on the open road. Some folks like getting out on their bicycle. Me, I like getting my motorcycle out of the garage. But it's also the highest season for crashes, with most of these crashes taking place between the months of May and September. Part of the reason for this is it's also the time of year that people are out mowing their yard. When grass clippings are left in the road, it can create a deadly hazard as grass clippings can cause a bicycle to lose traction. It's just like driving on a road during an ice storm, except this particular hazard is 100% preventable. In 2015 alone, there were over 3,700 motorcycle crashes and over 1,000 bicycle crashes in the state of North Carolina. Alamance County would like to take the time today to ask that you kindly blow your grass clippings back into your yard after you've mowed. Keeping clippings out of the road protects bicyclists and other cyclists. Keeping us safe will make for better and safer experiences for everyone who shares our roads. <coughs> and that's it.
Very good. Very good. Well, well, cyclist. I love it. Yeah. 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 I'm running on the bike uh, right channel. We have to raise public <laughs> awareness. And, uh, you know, I'd say since this has been brought up uh, by the citizen, uh, we've had discussions with our contractor that mows our facilities, making sure that uh, they're blowing our clippings back into the county's yard. So uh, hopefully it'll make folks think. Uh, we appreciate the gentleman. I don't know. And he is, right Mr. Armstrong. And, and, and I want to take the opportunity to say thank you for letting me learn about this. This has been educational for me. And I now blow my kid clippings back. <laughs> <in my office. laughs> and there you go. Thank you. And, and getting the landscapers to be aware of this is a very important thing. Sure. And their helpers. Yeah. All right. Uh, commissioner comments. Gentleman right here that brought these homeless children. I think the first time I ever heard about this was years ago. I can't tell you why or where. I tell you where. I don't know what happened, but I was at Myrtle Beach and somebody was telling me about the homeless children in Ory County. And so I didn't understand what they were talking about. And yes, some were living on the beach. Some were going into the library, literally camping out in there practically till they closed it. And I understood that could be the case because of it being such a tourist-driven area. But I came back to Burlington, went over to Vaughn Road to the administration office, and this was, oh God, this was seven years ago, eight years, ten maybe. And they told me we had these numbers and more, you know, back then. I think it was pushing 700. And, yeah, and, and Guilford County's got the same situation. And uh, But it's my understanding that some of the de definitions I don't question the definitions, but you know, like if a kid lives with another kid rather than go home or something, that that is counted as a home. But I agree, it, it is a major issue. And uh, it's, uh, I knew of a kid that slept out in a gazebo at a high school in Guilford County, would not go home, and would literally sleep in the gazebo at night. And uh, you go in the bathroom the next morning, clean up. I mean, it is stunning what, what's going on. And I appreciate you doing this. I would like to, for you to realize that, look, uh, these are just the ones that are identified. Identified. Right. It's not counting those that are not. And under school age, it's not counting those. Wow. Oh, I hope to make that be let's put it that way. As long as it's around lunchtime. Because <laughs> I got to go work. We'll be, we will be serving lunch. I'll be and it's day. free. <laughs> no, seriously, it's a great concern. I have to be in Greensboro every day at about 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, now the school's in. But that's a good time for me, so I, I, my interest is there. All right. Amy, anything? I don't have anything to add to the things I've already said. Bill? No. Bob? I'd, I'd like to add to about my report at attending the uh, commissioner's statewide conference. Uh, we had our board of directors meeting and I finished my uh, remaining term on the board of directors representing District 11 which consists of six Piedmont area counties. So this is a term that was started by Dan Engel and when Dan resigned it was a two year term. I finished out his last year of that term so I'm no longer on the board. But uh, this was a really, really jam packed three days of uh, workshops and uh, meetings and ju just I want to give you an idea of some of the things that I attended uh, and there are lots of other choices to, to attend but these are the ones I chose. <coughs> one, one was on uh, public health hot topics, Medicaid reform, communicable diseases and opioids. One was uh, we heard from a, a history professor from UNC who spoke about the, uh, the history of uh, schooling in the New South and it, he kind of outlined how the schools developed in the period from 1880 to 1920. Very, very interesting. Which still had manifests itself in today's educational system. Uh, we had the executive director and a couple of other staff from the education lottery. So one thing I, I confirmed, and everybody needs to know about this, that the, the monies that are raised by the education lottery is essentially, you, they're used to supplant dollars from the general fund that used to support education now they're coming from the lottery itself so it did not result in increased funding to our schools because of that lottery the public I don't think the public understands that we've been duped in my, yeah. in my what's, view what's <laughs> about that, right? the ABC's, um, that's the way the ABC's came in Alamance <laughs> County the same way 
And uh -huh. I don't what they do with that money. Uh, I had a really interesting uh, program on the understanding the basics of mental health, developmental disabilities, and substance abuse services. And we talked about uh, Cardinal and the other MCOs, what MCOs were, and the old mental health authorities, and the LMEs. Those words are all interchangeable. So, right, Rick? So, technically. Um, making sense of solar and renewable energy. Uh, very interesting, uh, you know. There's a North Carolina is leading the country, other than California, in the um, uh, expansion of uh, solar energy. Uh, we had a great walking tour of downtown Durham. This was held in Durham. There is so much economic development going on in downtown Durham. Uh, it's really a uh, lot can be learned from that. I mentioned that we had our youth involvement breakfast with all the 4-H participants from around the state. Uh, great breakfast and, and hearing the uh, speaker Sue Keebold by the way her, her son was a high school student at the time he was a, a senior in high school it, it happened on a Tuesday after he had the <coughs> most wonderful weekend he said of his life attending his high school senior prom this was just a model family just as normal as can be in, the, in that happened um, we uh, Met with the uh, people from Davidson County. This was a workshop about how they conducted their opioid form. So that was very interesting. And when we have our next meeting, I'll uh, explain some of the things that they did that we might adopt for our form coming up. Uh, we had a great awards luncheon, and yours truly is now officially a um, a bona fide um, commissioner practitioner. <laughs> so I met the requirements due to education, service to the association, and of course the new commissioner orientation. You're in points from the local elected leaders academy. Uh, we had our business meeting where new offices were elected and there's a great trade show. This, so this is interesting. You know everybody's been to trade shows where you have booths set up from all the vendors that provide services to local governments. Well I had an email the prior week from a constituent, and I think he sent it to all of us, who had an issue with the Republic uh, Waste Management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you all get that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I emailed him back, and I, and I think somebody already forwarded it to, to Brian. But then I was walking around the trade show, and there's the Republic booth. So I said, <laughs> oh, by the way, I get this email. I have this email, and I showed it to him. And he said, let me send it to me, and I'm going to contact that person, which he did. Which was which free, got it resolved, kind of free yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope it's resolved. Brought notice to the problem. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and then uh, there's a great. Uh, I was telling Brian that I uh, came across one vendor who is an architectural firm who specializes in doing space assessments for county governments. So it might be something that's valuable to us. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I think going to these uh, conferences are very beneficial to everybody. So thank you. That's my report. All right. Thank you, Bob. All right, now we're, I would like to make a move that we go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318-11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding the claims made in the case entitled Randleman versus Terry, versus Terry Johnson. And I'm looking for a second on that. Second. Thank you, Bill. All in favor? Aye. 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 Mm -hmm.